Welcome to our online service for Saturday, July 10th and Sunday, July 11th from Pinnacle Lutheran Church in Rochester, New York. This is the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, and our opening hymn today is Speak, O Lord, Your Servant Listens. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below. And we make our beginning today in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's psalm has two parts. The first is a plea of the psalmist to God. The second is an announcement of God's promised salvation. We now use Psalm 85 as we confess our sin, and also as we hear God's forgiveness for Jesus' sake. Lord, you are favorable to your land. You restore the, the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered, you covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You, you turned, turned from, from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We confess, Lord, our God, that we have listened to the voices of Satan, the world, and our own desires. We have not loved you with all that we are and have, and we have not considered our neighbor's needs as important as our own. We can only throw ourselves on the mercy of your gracious court and ask for forgiveness that we may amend our sinful ways. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground. And righteousness looks down from the skies. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make, and make his, his footsteps, footsteps away. The steadfast love and faithfulness of our God are endless. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for all of our sin, God declares us to be his own children and has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our service continues <clears throat> with the Kyrie. In peace, holy and blameless before him, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have, Lord mercy. have mercy. For peace from God's blessing us in Christ, choosing us in him before the foundation of the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the peace of the whole world, in which all things work according to the counsel of his will. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For this holy house and all places where people hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord, until we acquire possession of our inheritance. Amen. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you gave such faith to your prophets that they listened and boldly spoke what they heard you say to them. Grant that we hear what you have to say now, and confident of your promised salvation, that we speak words of comfort and peace in a world that desperately needs both. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from the seventh chapter of the book of Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, 
Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, said to Jeroboam, king of Israel, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all of his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away from the land to to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are invited to read the gradual together. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And our epistle lesson is from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the, might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you're invited to read the Alleluia verse together. Alleluia. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Alleluia. And the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. The sixth chapter. And King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. And some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers were at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother and his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was righteous and, or a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. 
For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask, a, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent to an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Our hymn of the day today is Hark the Voice of Jesus Crying. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I think we're all familiar with the, the wisdom or the adage that we're supposed to know our opponent or know our enemy. We know that we do this all the time. The world does that all the time. If we have a favorite sports team, we know that those sports teams are actively involved in looking at the film of their opponents from week to week or from game to game so that they know how the other team looks on their offense and on their defense. They can be prepared for the plays that they're going to, to encounter. A chess master, likewise, is going to study the games of another chess master before he goes and plays so that, again, he knows the strategies that the other person would use. And, of course, in the business world, we know that our, co that our corporations spy on each other and we, we, they pay for insider information so that they can know better what their opponents are doing in the marketplace that they might gain a competitive edge. And in a much more serious manner, we should know as Christians our enemy. How well do we know our ultimate enemy, the old evil foe, the devil, the ruler of this world? What is his agenda? Are we familiar with the ways that he works? Are we familiar with his strategies, with his tactics? Are we prepared to meet him or his minions in the world? Now, we know that the devil certainly seeks all manner of violence and wickedness. And, of course, the more of that there is, probably the happier Satan is. But that's not the whole thing. Really, at the root of everything, Satan is after unbelief. Because it's not the wickedness and the evil that's going to, be, that's going to condemn the world, but it is the faithlessness, the fact that he could draw people away from faith that ultimately is what condemns. And so we know that the devil wants to keep unbelievers in their unbelief so that they have no hope of salvation. And we know that he wants to take us as believers and draw us away from the promise of God, entice us away from, from our Lord and Savior, from faith to unbelief. But then what do we know of the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit want? Well, the Holy Spirit, of course, wants just the opposite. He wants to sustain faith in our hearts. The Holy Spirit wants to tighten the bonds between us and our Savior. And how does the Holy Spirit go about doing that? Well, he does that by the means of the Word of God. Through the law, he convicts us, he confronts us with our sins and the things that need to change. And through the promises fulfilled in Christ, the gospel, the Holy Spirit creates faith in us, he sustains faith in us, and he gives us the joy that we have in our salvation. And so the entire battle really hinges on the Word of God. The devil's goal is to prevent sinners from hearing the Word of God, which is how he keeps them from gaining faith. And the Holy Spirit, of course, works through the Word of God to create and sustain faith. So it's been this way from the moment that we fell, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. If you remember what the original temptation was in the Garden of Eden, back in Genesis 3, the serpent said to Eve, did God really say? And so the whole crux of what Satan has always been doing is getting us to question the very word of God. And that's what we see in our Old Testament lesson. 
that the same dynamic played out from the time we fell all the way to the present day. In our Old Testament lesson from Amos, which takes place around 760 B.C., we see Amaziah likewise questioning the word that Amos was bringing. So just a little background for where we are historically. So at this point in Israel's history, the, the kingdom is divided. We have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And you'll recall that right after Solomon's death, King Solomon was the son of King David, right after Solomon's death, the kingdom split in two. Ten tribes were in the north, two tribes were in the south. And, but Israel as a whole, north and south, were God's covenant people. God had made a covenant with them to be their God. And so, his, as we've been hearing for the past several weeks, His steadfast love endures forever. When we are faithless, God remains faithful, just as He was to the Old Testament nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. And so He raised up prophets like Elijah and Elisha, who are more well-known, and other lesser-known prophets like Amos to go to the northern kingdom to proclaim God's word, to proclaim God's judgment, to hopefully bring them back in faith. And so in the northern kingdom, instead of worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem, what the northern kingdom had done in order to help solidify their separation was they set up worship centers of their own. The true temple of God was in Jerusalem, but the northern kingdom under, under Jeroboam I had set up two temples, one in the north up in Dan and one down in the southern part of the northern half of the kingdom, and that was at a place called Bethel. And Bethel was only about 10 miles from Jerusalem, and yet the people of the north didn't go to Jerusalem to worship. They went to Bethel. And that's where we find Amos today, at Bethel, as people are gathering to worship. But what we find, as we see in our reading, is that people in charge at Bethel, the priests at Bethel, didn't want to hear what God had to say and they certainly didn't want to hear what God had to say through Amos because Amos brought a word of judgment. God was giving the northern kingdom a word of judgment, again, to bring them back, to draw them back, to wake them up, to bring them to repentance. And so Amos came with the words we heard today. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel, the ones who were in Dan and the ones that were in Bethel, the sanctuaries of Israel will be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And Amaziah, the priest at Bethel, hears what, what Amos is saying, and he goes and he turns him in to the king. He complains to King Jeroboam, and this is Jeroboam the second, not Jeroboam the first. And he says, Amos has conspired against you, O king. And, and so to, what we find out is that to proclaim judgment against the sanctuary is to proclaim judgment against the government. The temple and the government are one and the same. The, the northern kingdom, likewise, is a theocracy. And so there is no separation of, of temple and state or church and state. So to proclaim judgment against the temple is to proclaim judgment against the nation. And Amaziah considered Amos's words to be conspiracy, that he was trying to undermine the government. He thought it was a human message invented by either Amos or maybe somebody in the southern kingdom to serve their own political agenda, to undermine the kingdom of the uh, nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. And so we're, advi we're advised to know our enemy. This is one of the enemy's tactics. This is how he works. The evil foe tries to prevent sinners like us from hearing the life-giving word of God. And he does it by leading people like Amaziah in our reading to discount or trivialize ignore or dismiss the authoritative word of God. And they just dismiss it as simple human speech or a matter of opinion. So Amos repeatedly, if you look at the, if you look at the text in Amos, repeatedly says, thus saith the Lord. This is what God is saying. And yet the opponents essentially were saying, no, that's what you're saying. This is your opinion. And then Amaziah goes and tries to pressure Amos, if you remember in our reading, to leave. Suddenly he feigned concern for Amos and his welfare, and he pleads with him to go back to his home in Tekoa, which is down in the southern kingdom, and he says, O seer, go flee. Flee away from the land to the land of Judah. And so Amaziah was now 
pretending to be Amos' friend, even though he was the one who had turned Amos in to the king in the first place. He's feigning concern, and that's another ploy of the devil. He's cunning. He is deceitful. He's conniving. If he can find any advantage in how he can approach, he will use any means at his disposal to achieve his ends. The kingdom of darkness doesn't want us to hear God's word. Didn't want us to hear God's word in the Garden of Eden. Didn't want us to hear God's word in a time of Amos and the northern and southern kingdoms. Doesn't want us to hear the word of God today. It, again, it leads people to discount the word of God as only self-serving sort of religious talk. The world thinks of religious people as, as of religion as being something for those who are feeble of mind who, and used as a tool to enrich the people who are preaching. The world says, don't impose your religion on me. Keep it to yourself. And we hear that increasingly in our day in America. Don't preach to me. Keep your thoughts to yourself. Keep your religion to yourself. If you want to believe, that's fine, but you can do it behind closed doors. Your opinion isn't welcome in the public square. But in all honesty, how ready are we to hear the Word of God? How often do we avail ourselves of the Word of God? Do we truly want to hear what God has to say? Think of all the things, even in our lives as Christians, that get in the way of truly hearing, truly absorbing, truly digesting the Word of God. And life is busy. I know every generation has probably said that, but it always feels like life gets busier and busier as the years go by. We're swamped with daily duties and activities, kids' activities, family activities, you name it. There's always something vying for our attention. So many other voices in the world that are also clamoring for our attention, whether you're listening to, you're watching the TV, you're on a computer, you've got your cell phone, we're connected to the Internet, and all we have are voices, a cacophony of voices, in a, you know, drawing our attention. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. He wants to prevent you from hearing the life-giving Word of God by drowning it out in a sea of other voices so that all you end up doing is listening to yourself. You can't trust what you're hearing out there, so I'm just going to trust what I believe on my own. But my brothers and sisters, God will not be silenced. He is the God who speaks. He is a God who's very near to us, not a God who is far away, but very near, who wants to be in relationship with his children. He doesn't hide in secrecy. The true God speaks as we see throughout Scripture. We see God always coming to initiate the relationship with his, with his fallen creation. We see it all the way back in Genesis and all the way through Revelation. The true God speaks in our language, in human languages, so that he can be heard and he can be understood. He reveals his will in clear human language because it is through that word that the Holy Spirit leads sinners to recognize their sin and repent. And that's why God called Amos in our Old Testament lesson today, so that ancient Israel would hear the word of the Lord, would see their sin, would repent, would turn away from their evil, and would return back to the Lord. But we know from our vantage point these many years later, we know the end from the beginning. We know that Israel didn't listen to Amos or to any of the other preachers that God sent to Israel to bring them back. And so ultimately, as Israel finally rejects God, he raises up the ancient Assyrian Empire who destroyed the northern kingdom. That happened in 722 B.C. And unfortunately for the southern kingdom, down in Judah where Jerusalem was, they didn't learn their sister's lesson. And so a scant century later, God has to raise up the Babylonians who then take the, who take the, the southern kingdom into captivity, destroy the city of Jerusalem, and destroy the temple. But that's not the end of the story. That's never the end of the story. God's message doesn't end with judgment. God's message doesn't end with revenge. God's message ends with promise. God spoke promise through all of the prophets in the Old Testament. Yes, they had a hard message. Yes, it's difficult to hear when the judgment is being turned against you. But there was also words of promise, and Amos is no exception. The sure and certain promise that one day God was going to reverse that judgment, that God is going to restore Israel. Later in Amos, God promised that he would raise up another king, like King David, in that Davidic line, 
um, that they would be renewed through this greater Davidic king who would restore the people of Israel. And further, he says he was going to include the Gentiles in this future kingdom. So that they who, remember, the Gentiles were not part of the Old Testament covenant. God didn't make a covenant with those who were not Jewish. The Gentiles were separated from the, from the nation of Israel. Israel is the one who, who are God's children. And yet God made a promise that he was going to extend the kingdom to include the Gentiles so that the entire world would be God's children. It would all be God's own people. And in the fullness of time, that promise was realized in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the new and greater David. Jesus also came as the new and greater prophet, like the prophets of the Old Testament, but greater. And like the prophets of the Old Testament, our Lord was rejected, just as they were rejected. But his rejection, his death, is our salvation. God, our Heavenly Father, laid on him the iniquity, the sin of all of us. He suffered in our place on the cross, and he died a sinner's death so that we might be forgiven. But then God raised him up on that first Easter. Three days later, just as he had promised through Amos, we get a little glimpse of the resurrection in here. In Amos 9.11, in our reading, the Lord, says, or the Lord says, I will raise up the booth of David. And so God was saying he was going to raise up that Davidic line. Now the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God the Father, the Spirit of the Son, our Lord and Savior, is at work. He continues to work through his word through the ancient prophetic word of law and judgment, that God still leads us to recognize our sin. He leads us to repent. He leads us to turn away, knowing that often the way that we live, the way that we think, what we value is at odds with what he has revealed. And so that he, the law helps us to stop listening to ourselves, wake up and listen to our Lord. And then through that word of promise, through the gospel, he creates and sustains faith. He transforms our lives. Through our baptism, he has put his name upon us, and now we know that we belong to him, adopted as his children. And furthermore, he promises that one day we will inherit the new and greater promised land, the holy city, new Jerusalem, the new creation, and we'll receive that as our inheritance in Christ. My brothers and sisters, know your enemy. Be ready for him. He wants nothing more than to tear you away from the Word of God. Hold fast to what you know is true. Hold fast to what our Lord God promises. Only His Word can lead you to recognize your own sinful selfishness. Only His Word can sustain faith in your heart. Only His Word can lead you to eternal life. Despite so many confusing voices, including our own sometimes, listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say to you. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit keep your hearts and minds in faith to life everlasting. Amen. Our service continues today with the Creed. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed as they are printed. I believe, I believe in, one in one God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and, and was, was incarnate, incarnate by the by Holy Spirit, Spirit of the Virgin, the Virgin Mary, Mary, and was, was made, made man, man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. Pilate. He, he suffered and was and buried, and, buried. And, and the third day he rose again, again according, according to, the scriptures, to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and, and sits at the right hand of the Father. Of the Father. And, and he, he will, will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, 
who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. And our service continues with our prayers. Let us pray for the whole people, the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would uphold and strengthen all families on the earth. We pray that you would guide parents to teach their children all that you have done and all that you have promised. Grant your blessing wherever your people gather around your word and sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, when the world seems to be winning and your holy name is used without thought, we pray that you have put a strong confession on the lips of church leaders everywhere. Grant that they are used so that the reality of your power and grace would shine to dispel fear and would bring many to faith in our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that you would extend your kingdom through mission efforts around the world. Open voices to speak your word of judgment and grace and open ears to hear your invitation to turn and be saved. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Raise up, we pray, leaders at all levels of government who will order society according to your will. Strengthen those who protect at home and those who defend abroad so that our nation and all others would find peaceful solutions to chaos and conflict. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that you would hear the prayers of the poor so that their daily needs of food and clothing and shelter would be available to them. Bless all who grow and distribute crops, all who seek to alleviate pain and suffering, all who fund and build decent housing. Listen especially to those, to those whose needs we know, especially those listed on our prayer list and those we bring before you in our hearts. Give them the healing, comfort, and hope that fits your gracious plans for them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your grace for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, our Father who, who art, art in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. And our closing hymn today is sent forth by God's blessing. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below.